two more witnesses testify. PNG music legends reunite for West Papua. And district focus on SMEs. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Thursday's news. Two more witnesses have testified at the trial of Richard Namaliu, accused of the murder of former Miss PNG Ruby and Laufer. The two are late Ruby Ann's father, Maurice Laufer, and Henley Logoso, one of Ruby Ann's close friends. The four-day trial at the National Court in Port Moresby completed day two today. Tekla Gunga reports. Before the sixth witness could testify in court, the court made a ruling on an objection made yesterday by the accused lawyers to not talk about events that happened before the day of the incident that led to the death of the former beauty queen. The court allowed the two witnesses to testify, stating that it will give the court an understanding of the kind of relationship between the accused and the deceased. This matter has been adjourned to tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. because the medical doctor who was supposed to have testified today was not present in court. The late Rubian Laufer died on 11th February 2017. A former boyfriend, now the accused Richard Namaliu, was charged with murder. Namaliu pleaded not guilty at the start of the trial yesterday. It has been two years since this matter was first mentioned in court and late Rubian's family have been pushing for a justice ever since. This trial is expected to take up to four days and three more witnesses are expected to testify in court. Now, under the PNG laws, a person is innocent until proven guilty by the courts. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. The Wagani Committal Court has struck out two separate cases involving two different women who were charged for unlawful wounding. Lena Sampson first appeared in court in June. This morning, there were no instructions from her arresting officer. The other accused, Ruth Smith, had her case first mentioned on 15 August 2019, but the police prosecutor told court there were no instructions from her case officer also. Senior District Court Magistrate Cosmas Bidar struck out the cases because three months have lapsed and there was no court file served on the accused. 400 informal businessmen and women gathered last weekend for the launch of Mosby Northeast Yumi Growing SME, an intensive economic growth investment program. The initiative by Mosby Northeast MP John Cowper aims to set aside 2 million kina in counterpart funding with NCDC to help the informal SME sectors in the electorate. With 85% of Papua New Guineans earning a living from informal sector, local member of Mosby Northeast, John Cowper, has decided to help individuals and families running small businesses through the Yumi Growim SME, an intensive economic growth investment program. Kaupa says funds allocated for the SME development program is from the DSIP funds where 2 million kina has been budgeted for the program and another 2 million from NCD Governor Poes Pakop. It's all about me helping you. One of you good at working on me and helping you, empowering you. From nothing you can become somebody. We'll start to Project manager Peter Gamai says in order for individuals to access the funds, they must meet certain specific criteria. Our participants will now start to uh, do the savings. And uh, from there we, we will see that now they're saving the money in their account. So then uh, we will see it as a collateral for us as management to, to help them in a bigger way. The Yumi Growing SME initiative was launched in the presence of 400 small SME owners in the Mosby Northeast electorate. Each of these people are buoy and smoke sellers, trade store owners, poultry and piggery farmers, and other small types of informal businesses that generate income. 
informal sectors minimum sebab how you survive how you strong and making bread now but up little morning now begin ni boleh go school how you got bus pay that you give more self sustainability you be some man i go to school in we talk about SME or small medium enterprise but how are we going to explain to our mass population who don't know about SME train them upskill them uh, with uh, appropriate uh, uh, skills like financial literacy skills and other skills that it has associated with uh, that to enable them to be able to do something. Those applying for funds will go through an application process and the funds to be released directly from the office of the member. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Yo, with National MTV News, we'll take a break now, but stay tuned for all of the day's other stories when we return. Welcome back to the news. Some of PNG's music legends have come together in a bid to raise funds for children from West Papua residing in refugee camps. They will perform at a music festival scheduled for October 25th at the Laguna Hotel. The big names of PNG 90s music like Lister Laka, Dikadai, George Love and Trio Wespa are expected to perform all-time hits at the music festival. All the groups Dikadai, Lister Laka, George Love, uh, Wamsi Ilau, David Sound and... Yes, it's all... Uh, Freddie. Freddie Harrison. So it will be great. Uh, uh, musical uh, entertainment by the times. Founder of Trio Wespa, George Demara and wife Eileen belted out some of their hits which will be performed at the music festival. These legends of PNG music are urging the public to support them as part of their proceeds will go to charity and they will also want to perform in Cannes during the Indigenous Music Festival in November as well. Uh, fundraising is also to, to supporting early learning school in refugee camp. So some of the contribution will be go to the early learning from uh, to supporting refugees uh, education up in Kiunga and then also assisting ourselves, especially the musicians who are willing to come across to Australia. But we got a number of them. The musicians and artists will be performing at Laguna Hotel on the 25th of October and the tickets are being sold for 50 kina. Adelaide Xerox Kari National, MTV News. To some overseas news, the latest warnings from the United Nations Climate Panel could spell trouble. For the first time, the UN has done a comprehensive audit of our oceans and sub-zero climates revealing more major concerns for our planet. Ice sheets are melting faster than ever before. pushing up sea levels around the globe. Climate change is already irreversible. Due to the heat uptake in the ocean, we can't go back. A United Nations panel of scientists has assessed how climate change is harming our seas and frozen regions. They warn sea levels could rise more than a metre by next century if carbon emissions aren't cut. The main driver, ice melt in Antarctica. That poses a threat for the 680 million people living on low-lying coasts. 
here in New Zealand, the sea level when we experience storms will go up. And so the coastal effects that we get will become more intense. The report also warns glaciers are rapidly shrinking and that has consequences from water supply to tourism. This will have implications for visitor flows down the west coast. A study produced earlier this year indicated that when access to the glaciers on the west coast is limited, it costs the economy of the west coast $3 million a day. West coast tourism operators have already changed the way tourists experience the glaciers. The bit of walk-on, walk-off glacier trips uh, were changed and have been lost. Um, the way that the clients get on the ice now is by a helicopter and they do a heli hike. But making adaptations can bring more problems. Helicopters are very energy intensive and the use of helicopters in the tourism product then drives and accelerates further climate change. A never-ending cycle of environmental harm, which the UN's climate panel says can only be limited with radical changes to human behaviour. The youngest royal is on his first international tour travelling with dad Prince Harry and mum Meghan to South Africa. It's the closest look so far of baby Archie and one of his first visits was to meet a veteran of anti-apartheid movement, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And 19 days old now, and little has been seen of Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor since his birth on the 6th of May. But here he was in Cape Town today with his mother and father to meet one of Cape Town's most celebrated citizens, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his daughter Thandeka. Archie inevitably became the centre of attention. That's something he'll need to get used to. Sensible conversation was temporarily suspended so that everyone could try a bit of baby talk. Encouraging sounds and, of course, admiring comments. Suffice it to say that Archie took it all in his stride and played his part to perfection. He's clearly a natural at this sort of thing. He won't remember it, of course, but the moment was captured for immediate release to many front pages. Archie and the Archbishop. National MTV News will be back with more after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The funeral of two West Papuan students in Jayapura yesterday has brought condemnation with West Papuans demanding Indonesian President Joko Widodo withdraw troops from the region. 32 people, including soldiers and police, were killed in two separate demonstrations in Wamena and Jayapura on Monday. Many of those killed were part of a group of more than 2,000 West Papuan students who withdrew from higher education institutions in other Indonesian cities and returned home. Yesterday, the bodies of two students killed by Indonesian security forces in Jayapura in a demonstration on Monday were taken to be buried. They were defiant during their short lives and their defiance continued after death. Their coffins draped in the band Morning Star flag as friends and relatives mourned for them. Jerry Murib was 23 years old. Hermanus Wesariak was 17. Both were shot during the demonstration at Chandrawasi University in Jayapura. Jerry and Hermanus were part of a group more than 2,000 who withdrew from education institutions all over Indonesia and returned home. They're calling it an exodus. The gathering at Chandrawasi University on Monday was part of the action seeking admission into universities in the West Papua region. Monday's protests in Wamana and Jayapura and the delivery of the message demanding an independence referendum have come at great cost. 32 people were killed, including students and members of the Indonesian security forces. What's also of concern is the presence of military-backed civilian militia, and they've been accused of previous atrocities, including a raid on a student dormitory in Jayapura, where three people were killed. West Papuan activists say groups like this have become increasingly open about their activities. We urge the Indonesian government, please, to stop using Indonesian militia 
to uh, against the people of West Papua. This is peaceful action by the student. It is only the UN intervention that will stop this carnage. At the funeral of Jerry and Hermanus, a silent protest and demands directed at the Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, withdraw troops from the Papua provinces. It's a message also issued by members of the ecumenical churches of Papua. Scott Waide, National MTV News. A planned armed robbery outside Westpac Bank around 12 midday today but was foiled by NCD police. One suspect apprehended with the firearm has been positively identified via CCTV from another company which was about to do banking. The suspect was identified in the CCTV footage with the same waste bag. A unit was sent out to scope the area after police received information of suspicious looking individuals in a white sedan frequenting the Westpac Waigani branch. The suspect who is apprehended at Westpac Waigani had in his bag a pistol and live ammunition. A NCD Zone 3 response unit went to check the area. There was one suspect who was standing outside the vehicle. When he saw police approaching, he attempted to run away when a member of the zone response unit chased him down and apprehended him while the other members in the police vehicle gave chase to the white sedan which sped off. Other police units responded quickly by blocking off escape routes. Shots were fired at the zone response unit and a dog unit by the armed criminals. The vehicle was abandoned by the gang at June Valley. Police chased them on foot but the suspects managed to get away. NCD Central Commander Anthony Wagambi Jr. commended members of the public for contacting police and sharing information when seeing that there were suspicious people in the area. He also commends the police units for their efforts in foiling the robbery and also for perseverance when being fired upon by the criminals. He is warning those that are planning to take part in crimes with violence that police are strategizing and the Metsup and his zone commanders will soon clamp down on illegal activities in the city. Anit Kora, National MTV News. An Indonesian aviation company Wise Air is looking to partner with the Department of Agriculture and Livestock to airlift farm and marine produce to international markets around the world. This partnership is expected to commence after a full feasibility study is done and certain agreements signed. The Aviation in Agriculture project embarked on by the Department of Agriculture and Livestock is to ensure that the government delivers to the people on two objectives, to provide guarantee markets for rural farmers in the country and to give the farmers a better price than what they currently get. The concept of aviation in agriculture has never been discussed in Papua New Guinea since independence. It is a concept that is totally different from the government's concept of freight subsidy exercise. The acting secretary for the Department of Agriculture and Livestock, Daniel Kombok, says this project will give an opportunity for local farmers to move their produce out instead of waiting till it gets spoiled and rotten. He says food produce will be airlifted from rural areas to central buying points under their partnership with Wise Air. And they're trying to assist us and they're going to take all the produce to the other side. So we are very thankful. We're going to use Cobra, we're going to use Mountain Hagen, we're going to use Najab and uh, also Port Mosby. And other, other small airstrips, most of the airstrips we're going to use because they have a smaller aircraft that can go into, into smaller airstrips, remote areas. So uh, this is a big time, big opportunity for our small people out there in the rural areas. They're going to sell their produce. They work very hard and they sweat and they have never seen a, they have never seen a way out. Now we, have, we are trying to provide a way out. Mr. Kombok says the department is looking at exporting fresh fruits and vegetables from the highlands, livestock, coffee, mud crabs, tuna, sea cucumber and other marine food. He also said there will be no middlemen involved in this project. Everything will be bought straight from the local farmers. Owner of Weiss Air, Captain Rizali Afandi, says he heard a lot about the potential stock of Papua New Guinea, but said there were fewer infrastructure and that interested him in the department's concept. During the, in the plane, we already discussed with Agus, we are probably we need a cargo terminal in the future, probably we, we don't know. But of course, I'm here to develop the, the department, especially the Department of Agriculture of Stock and Livestock, to develop this, to export the market, to export the product, etc. 
Director for Aviation in Agriculture Project, Jerry Carl, says they will need to discuss with private and government airstrips before planes actually land in rural airstrips. Mr. Carl says the project will make sure that it does not depend on the government for funding. We basically work on a business case. Let's work on a business case that this business can take care of itself. So the government invests in a capital expenditure, capital investment, like if it means to, be a, to have a warehouse operation to accommodate for uh, those fisheries product or agriculture product, so be it one off and finished. Let the business go and get the produce from the farmers, sell it to a lucrative market, so see the rate of return or the, the revenue from those sales can sustain the operation of the business. Vice Minister for Livestock, Connie Iguan, says in order to make this country rich and people have more money in their pocket, aviation in agriculture is the way forward. We can help our rural people on the produce that they have. It is our way forward now to help them to, to freight those commodities out so that they earn money and that's where we can make Papua New Guinea become the richest nation. That's the only way forward of, for us to take back Papua New Guinea, make people have, their, have money and the change of living we'll, we will see. Michelle Steven, National MTV News. Now to the UK. The battle of Brexit has resumed in Britain's parliament with the Prime Minister Boris Johnson doing his deliberate best to lose a vote of no confidence that would trigger an election and give him the chance to take Britain out of Europe without a deal. This isn't a Thomas Cook plane, but the man inside has a lot in common with the ill-fated travel company. Boris Johnson's prime ministership on the brink of collapse, and he's the one urging opposition MPs to finish him off. They have until the House rises today to table a motion of no confidence in the government. While appearing full of confidence, he desperately needs an election because he's lost his majority, he's powerless and baiting Labour to force one. I say it is time to get Brexit done and finally face the day of reckoning with the voters. Labour's staying in opposition is prolonging the pain for Johnson, who could be forced to delay Brexit again. Is he going to dodge a vote of no confidence in me as Prime Minister? to escape the verdict of the voters. It's very simple. If you want an election, if he wants an election, get an extension and let's have an election. It should have been a day of humiliation for Johnson after the Supreme Court's blistering judgment. Instead, it was a day of defiance. It is absolutely no disrespect to the judiciary to say I think the court was wrong. The first day back at Parliament, more like the first day back at school. Let them, let, listen, listen, listen. Coming up next, we'll take a look at some sporting updates in Chukai Sports. Stay tuned. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. The Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League Southern Confederate Rugby League covers Western Province, Central, Melbourne Bay Gulf Province and Northern Province and the National Capital District. The outside centres from the capital city are improving their standard of rugby league to catch up to the standard of the competitions in the nation's capital. There are 23 affiliated leagues in the Southern Confederate registered to the Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League, but only 16 leagues are currently in full competition. The Southern Confederate made a clean sweep in the Confederate Championships in Ley three weeks ago, but the team was dominated by Port Mosby Rugby Football League players. Pom RFL has been the standard for the Southern Confederate, and those based outside of Port Mosby always look to that standard. Very tough. Uh, 
uh, programs running. We, we appreciate the affiliates, outside affiliates, they are now trying to uh, pair off with PRL and their programs, so really... Uh, but Guaybo Mayri, Southern Confederate Director, says with the rollout of coaches and trainers workshops, under the Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League, it is helping to grow the standard. We are thankful to Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League for having that initiative to drive the upskilling programs down to the local levels, uh, club levels, in upskilling coaches and trainers, referees. Uh, that's, those are some of the performance enhancers down at the uh, affiliate and club levels. The PNG RFL sanctioned national club championships will see each of the 55 affiliated leagues to Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League have their competition premiers face off in a confederate knockout concept. For the final two teams in the four confederates to play in lay to be crowned the national champions of rugby league in Papua New Guinea. But the date is yet to be confirmed with most competitions still into the finals. The proposed date was the end of September but will be moved. The Southern Confederate however is preparing for their knockout stages to be played at a venue yet to be confirmed. But it's going to be an elimination process within the Confederates. That's, that's how uh, it was supposed to be programmed. So within the Confederates, we knock off all, all, uh, all club, uh, all league affiliate uh, club, clubs that have won grand finals. So it's more like a premier, premiership challenge. Fidelis Sukina National, MTV Sports. The Kyunga Rugby League hosted their grand final and the Kyunga Tigers were crowned the champions. The team will be representing the Kyunga Rugby League for the national club championships. Kwai Bumairi, the PNG RFL Southern Confederate Director, expressed his gratitude toward the Governor of Western Province, Toboy Awiyoto, for pledging his support to the competition, pledging 2 million plus to improve rugby league in Western Province. Uh, he's given... Uh one million to Kyunga Rugby League for the development of the the, the, um, the rugby uh, rugby oval there, and he also, also uh, committed another million to uh, to the bid team uh, for the for the Western franchise, and he gave the um, the champion team that's the Kyunga Storms uh, forty thousand for the participation in the national club championship so uh, you know it was a very uh, very uh, thankful gesture in uh, in the governor supporting rugby league chukai sports continues with world cup rugby after the break chukai sports welcome back to chukai sport Rugby's eligibility rules have again been thrust into the spotlight this time at the World Cup. Former Wales captain said the Cup's being brought into disrepute from a number of imports. Host Japan has 15 players who qualified on residency terms, but they face their own battle in their adopted nation as well. World Cup time, doesn't it? The other side of the argument, of course, being that foreign players can help strengthen these teams from countries that aren't traditional rugby powerhouses and help them become more competitive. It should also be noted that World Rugby is actually extending that residency qualifying period from three years as it is now to five years. That comes in at the end of next year. And for a long time, foreign-born players here in Japan have faced the additional cultural challenge of a traditional weary towards outsiders. It's one that the Brave Blossoms New Zealand-born captain has had to overcome. The moment is finally upon us. As far as stages go for Japan's Brave Blossoms, this was the biggest one yet. Captain Michael Leach receiving nothing but love from an adoring crowd in his third World Cup. But the former Chiefs player hasn't always been embraced by the nation whose hopes he now carries. I remember going to school and everyone looking at me going, well, there's a foreign kid. Leach moved here from New Zealand when he was 15. Rugby became his lifeline. This World Cup a chance to leave a wider legacy. Japan is a really closed off country and to have me as the face and at the front of the national team 
you know, I, I think I can connect with a lot of people that live in Japan and there's a lot of people that struggle here. While immigration's traditionally been resisted here in Japan, that attitude is slowly changing, thanks in part to an ageing, shrinking population. The 30-year-old's not the only high-profile Japanese athlete who's also an ethnic minority, with tennis star Naomi Osaka another helping challenge the country's racially homogenous self-image. I consider myself a bit of a hybrid Japanese person, so um, I think my role at the moment is very a very important one where um, Japanese people and, and foreigners come together and work towards, work towards a common goal. I mean, and that's another opportunity that we'll cover where we can prove that, you know, if we work together we can, you know, we can do some pretty cool things. Having led Japan to the upset of the World Cup in 2015, Leach is now hoping his team can go further on home soil and make it out of the pool stage for the first time. Uruguay's upset win over Fiji is the first time in nearly 50 years rugby has made it in the news for the football mad country. In 1972, a flight carrying a team crashed in the Andes Mountains and survivors began eating victims in a bid to live. But as this report goes, Uruguay's biggest ever rugby win has created a frenzy for the right reasons. Is this incredible one about Uruguayan rugby? South American passion off the scale. I'm really proud of my country. We're not the biggest, we're not the tallest. At just 95 kilograms and 1.75 metres, the 30-year-old Montevideo-born skipper is probably the smallest blindside flanker in international rugby. But like teammates, punched above his weight is the world's 17, Uruguay, 11 spots below their high-flying footballing countrymen, made Fiji pay for starting a second-string side. It was a huge turnaround from their 47-15 loss to the top-ranked Pacific nation at the last World Cup. We came here to win. We are preparing this since four years. The 30-27 triumph prompted Uruguayan football's biggest star, Luis Suarez, to take to Twitter. Great lads, awesome Uruguayan pride. Named after the country's national wading bird, Los Terros, next face Georgia, which they beat at the 2003 World Cup. Yesterday's venue, the Kamaishi Memorial Stadium, is a testament to hope and survival. But that couldn't inspire a Fijian victory, despite scoring five tries to three. The world number 10's farcical goal kicking ensured defeat and derision, leaving their New Zealand born coach to explain. Well, we've got 31 players here and it is really necessary to to give all our players an opportunity. These are tough times for Pacific Rugby on the big stage, which desperately needs a Fijian bounce back against Georgia next week. Chukai Sports ends there. Up next, here are the details for the next 24 hours. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Cloudy with chances of light showers in Port Moresby. Mostly fine in Daru. Partly cloudy in Kerma. Some light showers in Alutau and some showers in Popandita. In the Mamasa region, few showers in Lei, light showers in Medang, some showers and drizzles in Wewak and Twanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, brief showers in Lorengau, rain showers in Kaviang, rain showers and thunderstorms in Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe and Boka. And in the Highlands region, showers in Mount Hagen, some showers and rain drizzles with light variable winds in Garoka, Kondiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. Forecast for small ships, there is a renewal strong wind warning for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Karama to Yul Island to Hood Point 
Irma Coast to Samari Islands with waters of eastern and western Milne Islands, seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Samari Island to Cape Vogold, a Finch Hafen, seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Finch Hafen through Vitias and Dampier Straits to CRC Islands to Long Island, seas of 1.5 to 2 meters. CRC Islands, waters of CRC Islands to Long Island to Karkar Island. Medang to Bogia, to Wiwek, Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Manuts and its western group of islands, and with waters of New Britain to New Ireland and Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters. Waters of West New Britain, seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. A look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas wrap with southeast winds at 20 to 30 knots in the Solomon Sea. Seas slight to moderate with southeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas slight to moderate with southeast winds at 15 to 20 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slight to moderate with southeast to northeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And before we go to the US, US President Donald Trump released transcripts of his phone call to Ukraine's leader and immediately claimed they cleared him of any wrongdoing. His political opponents read the same transcript and immediately claims the very opposite. Donald Trump emerged before the cameras, attempting to dampen down the greatest firestorm of his presidency, mocking Democrats as they accelerate their efforts to impeach him. It's all a hoax, folks. It's all a big hoax. Uh, it's very sad what the Democrats are doing to this country. They're dividing, they're belittling, they're demeaning our country. So many leaders came up to me today and they said, Sir, what you go through, no president has ever gone through. And it's so bad for your country. Thank you very much, Mr. President. In a twist of fate, President Trump and his Ukrainian counterpart met in New York today. It was their phone conversation in July that has triggered this impeachment maelstrom. During that July call, Trump appealed for political dirt on Joe Biden and his son, even as Zelensky was today claiming he hadn't felt pressure to act. Nobody push it. Pushed me, yes. In other words, no pressure. But the transcript of that phone call to President Zelensky released today reveals what Democrats are describing as a mafia-style exchange. During that fateful call, Trump told the Ukrainian president, the United States has been very, very good to Ukraine. I would like you to do us a favor. There is a lot of talk about Biden's son. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, Zelensky replied, the next prosecutor general will be 100% my person. He or she will look into the situation. We will work on the investigation of the case. That for Democrats is the green light for impeachment. Full speed ahead. A US president caught asking a foreign leader to pursue an investigation against a political rival. Many also suspect that a $400 million arms deal to Ukraine was being linked to whether Zelensky followed through on Trump's request. The President of the United States has betrayed his oath of office and sacrificed our national security in doing so. Yes. So, Senator, what was your reaction when you read the transcript? Uh, a total abuse of power. You have the President of the United States uh, using the power and the prestige of the office of the presidency 
to ask a foreign leader to interfere in an American election and to harm one of his political opponents. But key Republicans are circling their wagons around the Trump White House. This phone call is not an impeachable offense, and if it becomes an impeachable offense, God help the next president and the ones beyond. The distribution of power here on Capitol Hill is simple. Democrats control the House, meaning that impeachment proceedings are almost certain to begin. But Republicans control the Senate. That is where a trial of Donald Trump would take place. And that means his conviction and his removal from office is unlikely. And that's been the news, sport and weather for today, Thursday, September 26, 2019. On behalf of the entire MTV News team around the country, good night.